Machine learning is a great tool that is revolutionizing our world right now. There are lots of great applications in which machine, and in particular deep learning, has shown to be way superior to traditional methods. Beginning from AlexNet for image classification to UNet for image segmentation, we see great successes in computer vision and medical image processing. Still, I see machine learning fail every day. In many of these situations, people fell for one of the seven sins of machine learning. While all of these sins are severe and lead to wrong conclusions, some are worse than others and even machine learning experts may commit such sins in their excitement on their own work. Many of these sins are hard to spot, even for other experts, because you need to look at code and experimental setup in detail in order to be able to figure them out. In particular, if your results seem too good to be true, you may want to use this video as a checklist in order to avoid wrong conclusions about your work. Only if you're absolutely sure that you didn't fall for any of these fallacies, you should go ahead and report your results to colleagues or the general public. Sin number one, data and model abuse. This sin is often committed by beginners in deep learning. In the most frequent occurrence, the experimental design is flawed. Examples are that the training data is used as test data. With simple classifiers such as the nearest neighbor, this immediately leads to a 100% recognition rate for most problems. In more sophisticated and deep models, it may not be 100%, but 98 to 99% accuracy. Hence, you should always scrutinize your experimental setup if you achieve such high recognition rates in your first shot. If you go to new data, however, your model will completely break and you may even produce results that are worse than random guessing, which means that your accuracies are lower than 1 over k, where k is the number of classes, which means that less than 50% in a two-class problem. In the same line, you can also easily overfit your model by increasing the number of parameters such that it completely memorizes the training dataset. Another variant is using a too small dataset that is not representative of your application. All these models are likely to break on new data when you employ them in a real application scenario. Sin number two, the unfair comparison. Even experts in machine learning may fall to this sin. It is typically committed if you want to demonstrate that your method is better than the state of the art. In particular, research papers often succumb to this one in order to convince reviewers of the superiority of their method. In the most simple case, you download a model from a public repository and use this model without fine-tuning or appropriate hyperparameter search to a model that was developed exactly to the problem at hand and you tweaked all the parameters to get optimal performance on your test data. There are numerous instances of the sin in literature. The most recent example is exposed by Isensi et al. in their Not New Net paper, in which they demonstrate that the original unit outperforms virtually all suggested improvements since the method in 2015 on 10 different problems. Hence, you should always perform the same amount of parameter tuning to the state-of-the-art model as you applied to your newly proposed method. Sin number three, the insignificant improvement. After doing all the experiments, you finally found a model that produces better results than the state-of-the-art models. However, even at this point, you're not done yet. Everything in machine learning is inexact. Also, your experiments are influenced by many random factors due to the probabilistic nature of the learning process. In order to take this randomness into consideration, you need to perform statistical testing. 
This is typically performed by running your experiments multiple times using different random seeds. This way you can report an average performance and a standard deviation for all of your experiments. Using a significance test like the t-test, you can now determine the probability that the observed improvement are merely related to chance. This probability should be at least lower than 5 or 1% in order to deem your results significant. In order to do so, you do not have to be an expert statistician. There are even online tools to compute them, like for computing the recognition rate comparison or correlation coefficient comparisons. I'll put some links in the description of this video. If you run repeated experiments, make sure that you also apply Bonferroni correction. So you need to divide the significance level by the number of experimental repetitions on the same data. For more details on statistical testing, you should check out this video of our deep learning lecture. Sin number four, confounders and bad data. Data quality is one of the greatest pitfalls of machine learning. It may introduce critical biases and even result in racist AI. The problem, however, does not lie in the training algorithm, but in the data itself. As an example, we show dimensionality reduced recordings of 51 speakers using two different microphones. Because we recorded the same speakers, they should actually be projected onto the same spot given appropriate feature extraction. However, we can observe that the identical recordings form two independent clusters. In fact, one microphone was located directly at the mouth of the speaker and the other microphone located approximately 2.5 meters away on a camera recording the scene. Similar effects can already be created by using two different microphones from two different vendors or in the context of medical imaging by the use of two different scanners. If you now recorded all the pathologic patients on scanner A and all the subjects for the control group on scanner B, your machine learning method will likely learn to differentiate the two scanners instead of the actual pathology. You will be very pleased with the experimental results, yielding a close to perfect recognition rate. Your model, however, will completely fail in practice. So hence, please avoid confounders and bad data. Sin number five inappropriate labels. Already Protagoras knew, of all the things the measure is man. This also applies to the labels or ground truth of many classification problems. We train machine learning models in order to reflect man-made categories. In many problems we think the classes are clear at the moment we define them. As soon as we look into the data, we see that it often contains ambiguous cases, like images showing two objects instead of one in ImageNet. So it gets even more difficult if we go to complex phenomena such as emotion recognition. Here we realize that in many real-life observations emotion cannot be assessed clearly even by humans. In order to get correct labels, we need hence to ask multiple raters and obtain a label distribution. We depicted this in the following figure. The red curve shows a sharp peak distribution of a clear case, the so-called prototype. The blue curve shows a broad distribution of an ambiguous case. Here, not only the machine but also human raters are likely to end up in conflicting interpretations. If you used one rater to create a ground truth, you will not even be aware of the problem, which then typically gives rise to discussions on label noise and how to efficiently deal with it. If you have access to the true label distributions, which is of course expensive to get, you can even demonstrate that you can dramatically increase your system's performance by removing ambiguous cases. As we've seen, for example, in emotion recognition on acted emotions versus real-life emotion. This, however, may not be the case in your real application, as you have never seen ambiguous cases at all. 
Hence, you should prefer multiple raters over a single one. Sin number six, cross-validation chaos. This is almost the same sin as sin number one, but it comes in disguise. And I have seen this even happen in almost submitted PhD thesis. So even experts can fall for this one. The typical setting is that you have a model architecture or feature selection in a first step. And because you only have a few data samples, you decided to use cross-validation to evaluate each step. So you split the data into n folds, select the features or model with n minus 1 folds and evaluate on the nth fold. After repeating this n times, you compute the average performance and pick the features with the best performance. Now that you know what features are the best ones, you go ahead and select the best parameters for your machine learning model using cross-validation again. This seems correct, right? No, it's flawed because you already saw all the test data in the first step and averaged all observations. As such, the information from all the data is conveyed into this step and you can even get excellent results from completely random data. In order to avoid this, you need to follow a nested procedure which nests the first step inside the second cross-validation loop. Of course, this is very costly and produces a lot of experimental runs. Note that due to the large number of experiments that you are conducting on the same data in this case, you are also likely to produce a good result only due to chance. As such, statistical testing and Bonferroni correction are again mandatory as we already discussed in sin number 3. I would generally try to avoid large cross validation experiments and try to get more data, such that you can work with a train validation and test split that is fixed over all of your experiments. Sin number seven, over interpretation of results. Aside from all the previous sins, I think the greatest sin that we are often conducting in machine learning right now in the current hype phase is that we overinterpret and overstate our own results. Of course, everybody is happy with the successful solutions created with machine learning and you have all the right to be proud of them. However, you should avoid extrapolating your results on unseen data or state to have solved a problem generally because you tackled two different problems with the same method. Also claims of superhuman performance raise doubts because the observation we already made in sin number five, how would you outperform the source of your labels? Of course, you can beat one human with respect to fatigue and concentration, but outperform humanity in general on man-made classes? You want to be careful with this claim. Every claim should be based on facts. You can hypothesize on the universal applicability of your method in discussions clearly indicating the speculation. But to actually claim this, you have to provide either experimental or theoretical evidence. Right now, it is hard to get your method the visibility that you think that it deserves, and stating big claims will of course help to popularize your method. Still, I recommend to stay on the ground and stick to evidence. Otherwise, we might very quickly end up in the next AI winter and the general suspicion of artificial intelligence that we already had in the previous years. Let's avoid this in the current cycle and stick to what we are really able to demonstrate to achieve. Of course, most of you already knew these pitfalls. However, you may want to have a look at the seven sins of machine learning every now and then, just to make sure that you're still on the ground and have not fallen for them. So let's summarize what we have seen. Sin number one, the data and model abuse. Split training and test and check for overfit. Sin number two, the unfair comparison. Also tune the baseline model. Sin number three, the insignificant improvement. 
do significance testing. Sin number four, confounders and bad data. Check your data and acquisitions. Sin number five, inappropriate labels. Use multiple raters. Sin number six, cross-validation chaos. Avoid too much cross-validation. Sin number seven, over-interpretation of results. Stick to the evidence. So if you like this video, please tune in on my channel. You can also subscribe and see that we post here regularly videos on machine learning, newest research results, and of course, also various lectures with respect to the topic. So thank you very much for listening and bye-bye.